Now we're going to start with uh, Romans chapter 7 verse 14 and what we're going to talk about this is I'm, uh, these last verses of Romans 7 from Romans 7 14 to Romans 7 25 deal with the believer's state in this world our state in this world who we are what we are and how we are in this world so I'm going to divide this up because this is some of the most difficult language you'll find in Scripture. And some people, uh, uh, they approach it wrongly and they go off on wild tangents with it that really cannot be explained. But the key that I, I believe the key to understanding is, for example, just look at verse 14. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual. And then Paul speaking of himself in present tense, he says, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now, this is the same man who wrote up in chapter 6 and verse 7 that he's, free, he's dead to sin, freed from sin. Uh, he says that he's, uh, uh, in, in verse 18 of Romans 6, he's free from sin, dead to the law, all of that. How can the same man say at one point that I'm freed from sin, I'm dead to sin, and then over here, in verse 14, talk about how I'm, I'm carnal, I'm sold under sin, <clears throat> which literally means that, that I'm, uh, carnal means fleshly. That's what carnality is, the flesh, which is sin, sinful thoughts, sinful ideas, sinful goals, sinful motives, sinful desires. And then he says, I'm sold under sin, which means to be enslaved to sin. How can I be free from sin at one point and be enslaved to sin at another point, and, and, which means I can't rise above it? That's what that means. I can't get above sin. And so is this a contradiction? Well, the answer is no. There are no contradictions in the Word of God. We know that. And if you don't approach it that way, you're, not, you're going to miss it. You say, well, that, is that a preconceived notion? No, that's, a, that's the result of years of study and and even criticism, you know, I, I tried. I, before I was a believer, I tried to prove there were contradictions in the Bible and believe there were, but there are not. You've got to take each one in its context. That's one of the main rules of scriptural interpretation, context. And so what you got to have to understand that verse, verses uh, actually beginning up in verse 7 of Romans chapter 7, and then going all the way down to verse 25, what Paul's doing uh, in the uh, over uh, uh, theme of this is he's showing the role of the law in the believer's life. Now, what is the role of the law in my life? Well, uh, before I was converted, God the Holy Spirit used the law to convince me of sin and depravity to show me the impossibility of salvation based upon my law keeping and then to drive me to Christ for righteousness. He showed me that the perfection of righteousness required by God in the law is only to be found in Christ and not in me or by my works. That was the role of the law in conviction. Now that's what Paul was talking about in Romans 7, 7 through 13. And then in verse 14 through 25, he talks about the continual role of the law in a believer's life, which is to continually <laughs> convince me that I'm a sinner and that I have no righteousness, no holiness, no goodness, but that which I can find in Christ for salvation. And so it's a continual thing. And Paul shows that in his life. We, we know it in our life. Now let me give you some things that these verses are not teaching. Because it's, sometimes it's good to see what they don't teach before we get into what they do teach. First of all, Romans 7, 14 through 25 is not Paul referring back to his days as a lost person. A lot of people say that. They say, well, Paul, you know, li listen to what he says. He says, in verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. What I do, I don't approve of. He says, for what I would, what I want, that, what, what I want to do, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. That's strong language. What I hate, I do. And so a lot of people who don't understand salvation, they don't understand the law, they don't understand sin, they don't understand righteousness, 
they say, well, Paul's got to be talking about when he was lost because a, a, a saved person wouldn't talk like that. No, that's wrong. Every saved person talks like that. Plus the fact, too, just the point of language. And, yeah, you know, I know we're not, we're, not all, we're not Greek scholars or anything, but from Romans 7, 7 to 13, the verbs there are in past tense. But from Romans 7, 14 through 25, the verbs there are in present tense. So Paul is talking about this. This is what happened to me in the past. This is how I am today. So he's not talking about what he was as a lost person. Plus the fact, too, that the struggle. Now, there's a struggle described here by Paul. This is a struggle that only a saved sinner, a born-again person, can have. A lost person couldn't have this kind of struggle. They'll have struggles. For example, a lost person will have struggles of conscience. They'll have struggles with society and all of that, inward struggles. But this, this describes a spiritual warfare within a person that can only come to one who's been born again by the Holy Spirit, one who is looking to Christ for all salvation. Okay? So that, he's not talking about himself as a lost person. Secondly, he's not uh, speaking of one who sometimes, a believer, for example, who sometimes acts carnally, fleshly, sinfully, and sometimes acts spiritually in a way that's consistent with the word of God. And notice I didn't say righteously because we don't attain righteousness by anything we do. But Paul is not describing here one who at some time acts carnally and one who at some and then at another time acts spiritually. Now, you know that's true of believers. We can't we we are if we're believers, if we've been born again by the spirit, we can act spiritually. Hopefully that's what we're doing this morning. We're acting spirit. Now, that doesn't mean we're attaining the perfection of righteousness by what we're doing. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? You're sitting there listening. I hope your mind's on the word. <laughs> but you still have not attained the perfection of righteousness that can only be found in Christ. But you are acting spiritually. And, uh, uh, but now if you, if you skip worship for no good reason and go off on your own for your own selfish pleasure, what are you doing? You're acting carnally. Even though you're a sinner saved by grace. Now that's biblical. You remember when the Corinthians were dividing over preachers? And in 1 Corinthians, it's, I think it's 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, 3. Paul said, for you are yet carnal. In other words, you're not acting appropriately to your spiritual state. But now that's not what Paul's talking about here. That's dealt with in other passages of scripture. He dealt with that in Galatia. You know, where they were biting and devouring one another, that kind of thing, where they were uh, uh, being very judgmental in other places. So, yeah, believers can act carnally, and that's dealt with in the Bible. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. And then another thing he's not talking about is he's not talking about one nature that can only sin and another nature that can only do righteousness. Now, a lot of people look at this and they say, well, this is talking about the two natures flesh and the spirit. Well, that's okay if you want to use that language, but don't take it so far. Paul's not saying, well, there's part of me that does nothing but sin, and then there's part of me that does nothing but holiness and cannot sin. That's, that's, a, that's some sort of a myth that people buy into because they want to find righteousness in themselves. And they think they're giving God the glory. They're like those in Matthew chapter 7. Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name, you see? That kind of thing. So he's not talking about that. But he is talking about a struggle. You can call it two natures if you want. That's fine. I don't care. But what he's saying is sin is in me and contaminates everything I think, say, and do. And this is the believer's state. Now look at verse 14. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual. The law reaches to the heart. The law not only condemns sinful actions, but it condemns sinful thoughts Sinful goals, sinful motives, sinful desires, all of that, you see. It's not just 
taste not, touch not, handle not. Paul had already uh, been, uh, been convinced of that by the Holy Spirit when he talked about uh, covetousness, concupiscence, lust. When the law says thou shalt not covet, that's a sin of the heart. You may never go out and steal something that somebody else has, but if you covet it, that's sinful too. And of course, Christ dealt with that in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you've heard it said by them of old, it's that thou shalt not kill. But he said, I say unto you, it, it, to be angry with a person, to hate a person, that's murder in God's sight. He said, thou shalt not uh, commit adultery. I say unto you that it's sinful to lust after another person. So you see, that it's, these are sins of the heart. Well, what did that show, Paul? That showed him that he's carnal, sold under sin. He, he, he's in this body of flesh, and that's not just talking about the physical body now. That's part of it, because it's through our physical bodies that the sinful principles, the powerful law of sin, uh, makes itself known, manifest. When we use our hands, our eyes, our ears, our mouths for something sinful. And that's where we are. And that's, that's what we know. I mean, I can't, I can't get beyond this body of flesh. Now, I know people say, well, I can have an out-of-body experience. That's bull. This is, this is what we are. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I have a right standing before God. I'm righteous in his sight, but here I am in this state. And I'm a born-again person. I have a spiritual nature, if you want to call it that. That's okay. But I have a fleshly nature. So I have a desire. God has given me desires that I didn't have before I was converted. Now, that doesn't mean that the desire just to be good. All right, now look at this. He says, I'm carnal, and because of that, I'm sold under sin. I'm enslaved to my state, my status here on this earth, and I cannot, while on this earth, in this state, in this physical body, I can't rise above that. Now, a lot of people think they do, don't they? You know, there, there are people who call themselves Christians who say that they can rise above sin. And one old preacher said, the only way you're going to rise above sin is if you can live on the second, third, fourth, fifth floor. And there's sinners below you. But you're not going to rise above sin. You can't get away from your thoughts. I remember when I first moved to Albany, there was a couple here, and they'd just gotten back from a, a seminar from a false prophet named Bill Gothard. You hear me? A false prophet named Bill Gothard. And he was teaching them how not to sin. And he said, go home and get rid of everything in your house that causes you to sin. So they went home. They had some tiki god that they got from Africa or something. They got rid of that. And they started getting rid of this and getting rid of that. And I told the man, I said, well, look, you've got a problem. And he said, what is it? I said, you're still there. And you see the tiki god and all that, that's not the problem. You are. I'm the problem. I said, the only thing you can do is just stand in front of the mirror and cut your own throat, maybe. I don't know. But you're not going to listen. What did Christ teach his disciples? It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of the heart. You see that? Somebody say, sin's in the bottle. Well, you can use a bottle to sin. But sin's not there, sin's in you, it's in me. Sin's in, we're, we're going to go back and eat. Now, we can, we can use our mouths and our stomachs to sin highly. But, but the, the, it's not because of the food. Don't blame the food. You, know, you see what I'm saying? And that's what Paul's saying here. I can't rise above that. And, and he's telling us here that in our lives as believers... As sinners saved by grace on this earth, in our present state, the Holy Spirit, and that's why he starts with the law. He says the law is spiritual. All right, what does that do? <laughs> that tells me that I cannot attain 
in this state, by my works, in my thoughts, in my desires, I cannot attain the perfection of righteousness that I can only find in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. And if you look for it within yourself, there's only two things that are going to happen. If you find it, you're going to be a Pharisee. If you don't find it, you'll go into despair. Now that's what happens. Most people become Pharisees. That's what usually happens. But that's the way it is here on this earth. In other words, I have one hope of salvation, one hope of righteousness, one hope of forgiveness, one hope of eternal life and glory. Jesus Christ crucified and raised from the dead. His righteousness alone, which God has freely imputed to me, and I receive it by God-given faith. So, how am I freed from sin? How am I dead to sin? How am I dead to the law? Legally. Or as the old writer said, forensically. Objectively. As I stand before God in his, his court of justice, in Christ, I'm washed clean, free from sin, dead to sin in the blood of Jesus Christ. How do you know that? God cannot charge sin to me. Somebody says God will not. God will not. He won't. But he cannot. Why? Because he's a just God. He cannot charge or impute sin to me because he imputed my sin debt to Christ. He would be unjust to impute it to me too. I'm righteous in Christ. But now, you don't see it. And in reality, I don't see it with a physical eye. And what, what, what happens here is this. You know, we're all, if we're saved, we're sinners saved by grace. That's who we are. That's who we are. But all we see is the sin. You say, well, what have you seen me do? Well, I'll tell you exactly what I've seen you do. I've seen you get old. And you've seen me get old. Isn't that right? And that's a consequence of what? Sin. This body is dead because of sin. Now, that's what we've seen each other do. Now, we may have seen each other do other things we shouldn't have done. All right. But we know this. According to God's word tells us what? We're sinners saved by grace. This is my story. To God be the glory. But it's not the whole story. My sin's not the whole story. If it were, I'd be doomed. The whole story is how I stand in Christ. See? How I stand in God's sight. In God's judgment. In Christ. The world won't know us, will they? The world sees me as a weakling, as a sinful person. But God sees me as righteous in his son. Now, if we take that as the basis for what Paul's saying, look at what he's saying here. Look at verse 15. He says, for that which I do, I allow not. Now, what is, is Paul talking about some particular sinful problem that he had that he couldn't get rid of? You know, you know a lot of preachers preach it this way. Oh, if you have a particular sin in your life, particular sin, good night. Paul said, I'm carnal, sold under sin. Now, I know that if there are particular problems we have psychologically in ourselves, you know, we, we need to work on that. We do in a godly way. No doubt about that, but that's not what Paul's talking. Paul's not... He's not saying here that I have some particular sin that I do that I don't approve of. He says that which I do. Well, what do you do, Paul? Well, Paul preached the gospel. Paul covered the Gentile world, traveled. Paul suffered. All of that. But he said, I approve not. Well, Paul, don't you approve of preaching the gospel? Yes. Don't you approve of the suffering? He said, for Christ's sake, yes. What is he talking about? 
He's talking about in the realm of the spirituality of the law that, that in this way, what I do falls short of the perfect righteousness that I desire. And therefore I can't approve of it. And he says in verse 15, he says, for what I do, what, what I would, what I want to do, that do I not. Well, what do you want to do? Well, read Philippians 3, for example. He said, I want to attain perfection. But I don't. But what I hate that I do. I hate what he's saying here is I hate the fact that sin mars, contaminates everything that I think, say, and do. That's what he hates. Because his desire was to be conformed to Christ. And that's a desire that we all have. Now, I mean, we can talk about degrees of desire and all that. And, you know, I, I've heard preachers say, well, believers won't justify their sin. That's another bull. Especially when, when somebody does us wrong, you know, we just feel like, you know, we've got a right. We don't have a right. How do you know that? Because God said vengeance belongs to him, not to you. The Bible says we're to love our enemies. I desire to love my enemies. <laughs> but there are times I want to see my enemies get their comeuppance. How about you? You know. But you see, that's the struggle we have. And sin, even my desire to love my enemies is marred by my desire to see them get their comeuppance. That's the way it is, you know. You say, well, you're a walking contradiction. No, I'm not. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Look at verse 16. He says, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it's good. Now, Paul is adamant throughout these scriptures that whatever the law does in convicting me of sin... And showing me my sinful self and the fact that I cannot attain the perfection of righteousness that can only be found in Christ. The problem is not with the law. Now, how do people express that, you know, when they say the problem's with the law? Well, they might say something like that. Well, God requires too much of me. Or God's unreasonable to require perfection of me. Or God's not fair or just. No. First of all, if you know anything about the God of the Bible, you know that he can require no less than perfection. God is holy. God is just. God is, if God required less as to attaining or maintaining salvation, he would cease to be God. So he can require no less. But Paul's saying the problem's not with the law. The problem is with me. I'm the sinner. I'm the problem. So he says in verse 17. Now here's where the language gets a little difficult here. He says, now then, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Well, Paul, what are you saying? You don't do it, but the sin does it? Well, what is sin here? Well, the word sin here is the most common New Testament word used for sin, in, uh, translated from the Greek language. It's the, it's the same word, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that's exactly what it means. It's, it's the word that means that I fall short of the glory of God. When the Bible says that Christ was made sin, that means he was made to fall short. And what is the glory of God? Well, the glory of God is Christ. His glorious person, his finished work, his righteousness. And so what Paul's talking about is I fall short of that righteousness. And so he says, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. What's Paul doing here? Is he passing the buck? Is he saying, well, I'm not really responsible for this. It's just that old sin nature in me. I, I've heard people talk like that. They'll say stuff like, well, I've got a, a nature that does nothing but sin. And then I've got another nature that does nothing but righteousness. Is, you know, that, now, if you want to read anything like that, go get a copy of, of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. That's a fictional work. And so is their theology. It's fictional. That's not what Paul's saying. Listen, if we had a, a nature, a, a new nature that could not sin... Why would we say that which I do I allow not and that, that what I do I hate? 
And when Paul says, it's not I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, is he saying, well, I'm not really this person. It's not, you know, like, like sin's another person inside of me doing stuff, and righteousness is another person inside of me. Doing. That's not what he's saying at all. What I believe he's doing here, he's using metaphorical language to do two things. Number one, to trace it to its source. The problem, trace it to its source, and it's sin that dwelleth in us. I have sinful thoughts. I have sinful desires, sinful motives that I have to fight. And that's the problem. And it's not that I'm blaming sin in me. I'm the one who does it. I'm the problem, you see. But what Paul's also showing here is that the sin that he does, that mars everything he does, really doesn't identify him. It's not the real Paul. The real Paul. Who are you really? <laughs> Let's say last week somebody stepped on your toes and you lost your temper. You sinned with a high hand. Does that identify you as to your standing before God? Let's hope not. Does that identify you as your state? As a sinner saved by grace. In other words... Could somebody have seen you during that moment of time and then said, well, now there's a real sinner saved by grace. No. You know what they do. They say, well, good night. If he's saved, I am too, you know. Christian wouldn't act like that. You, you hear him. Wouldn't do that. Wouldn't do this. What, what is it a Christian won't do? In the Bible, I have found that there's one thing a Christian won't do. He will not totally, ultimately forsake Christ. And the only reason that he or she won't do that is because God will not let us go. That's right. So think about it. So Paul, it's sin that dwells in me. That, that doesn't really define, define the real Paul. The real Paul is a sinner saved by grace. One to whom God does not impute sin. One to whom God has imputed righteousness. That's the real Paul. Struggling. And he says in, look here in verse 18, he says, he says, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Well, what do you mean, Paul? Uh, we know the spirit of God indwells you. That's a, he's a good thing. <laughs> we know that spiritual life is there. That's a good thing. We know there are spiritual desires. Those are good things. Well, what Paul's talking about is goodness as it relates to Christ. Now, God does many good things for us and in us, but when they come through us, just like faith. Would anybody here say, I have perfect faith at all times and never waver, never doubt? I hope you wouldn't. Well, God's the one who gave you that faith. Did he give you something sinful? No. But when it comes through this flesh, it's marred by sin. And I'm like the disciples. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I still have a struggle. And it's an everyday struggle. And that's what Paul's talking about there. He says in verse 18, For to will is present with me. I have a desire to do good, to be like Christ, to be per perfect. But how to perform, now that's key. That word how's in italics, but to perform that which is good, I find not. I can't do it. Now, well, wait a minute, Paul. Where's the new nature that cannot do anything but righteousness? Well, he says, he says to perform righteousness, I don't, I don't even know how to do it. <laughs> I don't find that in me. And so he says in verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not. What good is he talking about? Paul preached the gospel. Paul prayed. Paul was used of God to write the scriptures. What good is he talking about? He's talking about the perfection of goodness, of righteousness, required by the law that can only be found in Christ. I can't do that. I preach the gospel, and I thank God that I do, and stay with the truth. But my preaching is not my righteousness before God. You, you see what I'm saying? I'm not going to stand before God by his grace. I'm not going to stand before him and say, Lord, Lord, I preached in your name. 
I've done many wonderful, I'm going to stand before God pleading the merits of the lamb. <laughs> I'm going to plead the blood of Christ. That's what we're going to memorialize here this morning. It's his blood. It's his righteousness. It's not my preaching. Thank God we have preaching. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. But my preaching, your listening, our praying, our singing, that's not our righteousness before God. It's Christ. And while we're in this state, even as justified and even as spiritual people, we cannot attain that. And that's what Paul's saying here. Verse 20, or verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. What is he talking about? Is Paul doing something evil? He's talking about the fact that he, does, he always falls short of the perfection of righteousness found in the law. And then verse 20, he says, now if I do... That I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now that's the same thing he said back up in verse 17. And it means the same thing here. He's tracing it to, his sor to its source, sin within me, in us. And he's showing that that really doesn't identify us, does it? Aren't you glad that sin is not that which identifies you? You say, well, I've got to own that I'm a sinner. Yes, but we're sinners Saved by grace. We're mercy beggars. We found mercy in Christ. All right.